Hello everyone, Simon here, and guess what? I have a book! It's an actual book! So this is Book of the Wonders of the Galaxy by me, I wrote it. A few months ago, I introduced this book, but it was only available as an ebook. Now, it is available as actual paper. So if you want to hold actual wood fibers in your hands, you can do so. Um, so for those of you who didn't see my last video on this, I wrote a science fiction book. And uh, let me just read the blurb to you, right? So what is this book about? This book is Nourish Your Imagination with a Science Fiction Journey to Places Both Familiar and Alien Throughout the Inhabited Galaxy and Beyond. What will humanity become in a future of extrasolar colonies, unfathomable sapient AI, and strange exobiology? Inspired by the travels of Marco Polo, each chapter of the book is a portrait of the character and essence of one planet or place, illustrating the interconnectedness of geography, astronomy, biology, economy, technology, and society. While the science fiction is speculative, it is woven from threads drawn from our own diverse history and cultures, so everywhere you look in this future galaxy, you'll find echoes and fragments of us. But this book is no mere fantasy, for we can only build what we can imagine, and each stop on the journey is a vision of a possible future we might build for ourselves. So, this book is about ideas. Ideas. So it's, it's got, uh, let me see, hmm, 43 chapters, and each chapter is basically one idea of the future, and then of our future, in fact. So if you're interested in science fiction and ideas, I advise you to buy my book. Of course I would. It's my book, right? So it's available from Amazon. There it is. Uh, I will put the links in the video description and maybe in the uh, in the video itself as well. So there's a Kindle version and there's a paperback version. So depending on how much you want to pay and whether you want actual paper in your hands, you can choose one of those. So that's it. I'm shilling for my own book. So now I think we should read a chapter. Yes, story time. Story time with Simon. So to give you uh, an introdu introduction or an example as to what sort of thing you can expect from my book. Let me just get comfortable here. All right. So this is chapter 32, The Golden Station. All right, here we go. It's not that long. Each chapter is not that long. The Golden Station is, without a doubt, the most opulent and most expensive space station ever constructed by humans. The station directly orbits a star near a small asteroid field and far from any planets. As it sits between the star and the asteroid field, ships visiting the Golden Station must approach from the sunlit side to avoid the rocks, putting the station on magnificent display. Its appearance is a strange mix of futurism and anachronism, a spinning dodecagon ring covered in transparent gold leaf that shields the interior from solar radiation, and adorned in neoclassical ornamentation and detailing. The rotation of the ring provides the station interior with artificial gravity, as well as causing the many gilded reliefs to glitter and sparkle in the sunlight. Golden colonnades and marble statuary alternate along both faces of the ring, with coffered and sculpted vaults lining the interior edge, while layered terraces frame the outermost side of the circle. The Golden Station was clearly meant to be a palace, ostentatious and unrivaled in its extravagance. There is no greater a symbol of wealth than it in the whole of the inhabited galaxy. Yet for all its luxury, no one has set foot on the Golden Station for many long decades, though the space palace continues to spin silently in the light of its sun in front of its retinue of asteroids. If you're unfamiliar with the history of the Golden Station, it must seem like an expensive oxymoron. It is the most costly space station in existence, yet it is un unoccupied. It is the most luxurious palace imaginable, yet it is sited in the void of space, far from any human habitation, a palace of nothing. To understand how such an edifice came to be, we must tell the story of the planet Eridu, a planet, an Earth-like planet, and a colony that is quite remarkable in its own right. 
Eridu lies on the same orbit as the Golden Station, directly opposite to it in their orbit, on the other side of their star. The early history of Eridu was unremarkable until surveys of its solar system discovered a deposit of unique minerals that could easily be forged into high-performance room-temperature superconductors, something that has not been found anywhere else in the known galaxy. This mineral deposit was precisely the asteroid field that currently sits behind the Golden Palace, although the palace was not built until much later in Eridu's history. The minerals held immense scientific and economic value for the planet Eridu, and they would eventually define the very identity of the fledgling colony. Superconductor technology wasn't entirely new, of course, but existing superconductors needed to be kept at very low temperatures in order to function, using a constant supply of liquid nitrogen as a refrigerant. This limited their versatility and applicability, applicability to very specialized uses. Room temperature superconductors, in contrast, needed no refrigeration and could be used in almost any imaginable context. For example, it became possible to create far more compact and powerful electronics with the elimination of electrical resistance as an obstacle to design. The widespread use of superconductors in electricity generation, transmission, and storage would lead to dramatic improvements in efficiency. Many things that were previously considered too expensive or technically challenging suddenly became practical. On Eridu, the semiconductor revolution was about to begin, but the fledging colony had little existing capacity for asteroid mining. Wait a minute. For asteroid mining... Okay, we got it. But the, the fledging colony had little existing capacity for asteroid mining at the time. To enable the de development of the new industry, the Eridu Asteroid Company was formed. The company was allocated the bulk of the available funds and resources in the colony to build the needed transport and mining equipment, and to begin manufacturing superconductors. Even as the company ramped up superconductor production as quickly as they were able, the demand for the new material was effectively limitless. The first application for the newly available room temperature superconductors were new supercomputers for every research institution on Eridu. Within a few years, universities of Eridu had enough computing capacity to rival even that of Earth, and they could operate this capacity at a fraction of the cost. In the following decade, a number of previously intractable problems in theoretical physics and exobiology were solved by the researchers of Eridu, catapulting the young colony into the forefront of science and technology. Superconductor technology also spread to businesses and consumer electronics. These new devices were smaller, lighter, more powerful, and more pervasive than ever before, and demand for them from across the inhabited galaxy was insatiable. The upgraded communications networks of Eridu enjoyed capabilities that the people of other colonies could only dream of, with practically unlimited light speed bandwidth available in every corner of the planet. Soon after, the quantity of superconductors was sufficient for their use to, s to spread to Eridu's infrastructure. When applied to electricity generation and transmission, efficiencies improved dramatically, transmission losses reduced to almost zero, and the entire infrastructure was miniaturized. In transportation, electric vehicles enjoyed greatly extended range and performance, while magnetic levitation trains became cheap enough to connect every town and city on the planet. Visitors to Eridu invariably remarked on the incredible vibrancy of the young colony where every citizen seemed able to enjoy a standard of living usually reserved for the most privileged people of the most prosperous planets. This was made possible by cheap and seemingly limitless energy, filling the cities of, Erid of Eridu with light and movement and music. Powerful computational capabilities were built into every conceivable device, and any feature an inventor could dream up, the computers were able to perform it. The sheer abundance of technology on Eridu would appear obscene to visitors from other planets, but it wasn't the wasteful overindulgence that it seemed to be. To the contrary, the superconductor technology allowed Eridu to be far less wasteful and far more efficient than any other inhabited planet. For decades, Eridu prospered with ever more widespread use of superconductor technology. Through it all, the Eridu Asteroid Company remained a monopoly, solely responsible for all asteroid mining and superconductor production in the Eridu system. Not everyone thought this was a good idea, 
there were occasional complaints about their undeserved market power, about a profitability that was based not on ability but on access, and about the risks of complacency. Economists would say that, in theory, the monopoly was unnecessary and potentially led to suboptimal outcomes for consumers. But everyone was too busy enjoying their new technology to pay much attention. Through two generations of steady management, the Eridu asteroid company had been credited as the key to the planet's wealth and advancement. With Eridu's development all but assured, it appeared that superconductor technology would quickly spread to the other planets of the inhabited galaxy, beginning a new age in human civilization, one where widespread room temperature superconductors would enable capabilities that previous generations couldn't even imagine. And the fact that the ownership of the Eridu asteroid company was passed from father to daughter, a little nepotism couldn't hurt much, could it? When the second president and owner of the asteroid of the Eridu asteroid company passed away from an unexpected illness, the role was inherited by her young daughter, of whom even the kindest biographers would describe as temperamental, capricious, and spoiled. Her first action upon assuming control of the company was to increase the price of the superconductors, stating that the company needed to raise more funds to expand production. This struck most observers as an odd decision, given that the company had always been expanding production while gradually lowering prices, as it took greater advantage of economies of scale. As the prices of the superconductors were increased, the demand for them leveled off and eventually began to decline. In more and more industries, the rising prices could no longer be justified by the benefits they bought. Still, the young president continued to increase prices even when demand dropped below production capacity. The technology companies that relied on the superconductors went out of business one by one, and public discontent with the company's direction grew. But the long history of goodwill and trust between the company and the people of Eridu convinced most to wait patiently for its president to reveal her grand strategy, or at least to come to her senses. By this point, the president of the Eridu asteroid company had become the richest person in the galaxy, hoarding an immense amount of wealth accumulated over three generations of their superconductor monopoly. She also counted as her property all the asteroids from which her family's wealth was derived, although most of the asteroids remained untapped. This was a sharp contradiction of the company's previous position, when the asteroids were considered the shared property of the people of Eridu, and the company merely performed the service of making the minerals accessible. As opinions of her and the decisions grew increasingly negative, she withdrew from the public life of Eridu and began to build a new home for herself in space amongst her asteroids. It was around this time that the people of Eridu began calling her the Mad Magnate. Her real name became so despised that people refused to speak it aloud, and eventually they forgot it altogether. The Mad Magnate insisted that her new home should, be, should truthfully reflect her status as the richest person in the galaxy, so no expense was spared. Indeed, the design of the Space Palace was expanded several times during construction, much to the delight of the highly paid contractors and to the disgust of the general population of Eridu. After several decades of construction, the Golden Station was complete, a bright neoclassical torus spinning silently in space between the priceless asteroids and their star. In addition to being op opulent beyond reckoning, a palace of numerous halls, ballrooms, baths, gardens, bedrooms, libraries, and galleries. The Golden Station was also the pinnacle of superconductor technology. The entire station was protected by powerful superconducting magnets that shielded it from the stellar wind, allowing the station itself to be almost entirely translucent, a glow with a bright light, a beacon in the blackness of space. The solar panels that supplied the station with power were so lightweight and efficient that they could be built directly into its structure, almost invisible to the naked eye. More than any other assemblage of superconductor technology, the electronics and mechanical components of the Golden Station were so miniaturized and efficient that it seemed like they didn't exist at all, that the station somehow was kept habitable by some unseen magic, an impossible paradise floating in the void. The Mad Magnate lived alone in her space palace, though she had numerous robotic servants that attended to her every need, and the station was supplied regularly by robotic transports. She never visited Eridu again, and she never invited anyone to visit her. 
although she would occasionally deign to make certain pronouncements to the people of Eridu. In a series of cryptic recordings, she claimed that the people of Eridu owed her all of their achievements to her and her family. By her reasoning, she had gifted Eridu with a new age of human progress, the age of superconductors, but the people of Eridu were clearly insufficiently thankful for her gifts. Most of her pronouncements were incomprehensible or self-contradictory, but one thing was clear, she had gone completely mad. An attempt was made by the government of Eridu to arrest the mad magnate and to seize control of the asteroids, but when their ships approached the Golden Station, the mad magnate informed them that all the asteroids had been trapped with explosives. As a demonstration, one of the smaller asteroids suddenly exploded spectacularly into powder. The people of Eridu had no choice other than to leave the asteroids to her. Some tried to placate her by asking how they might demonstrate their thankfulness for her gifts. Her demands were always insane. She would ask for a decade-long decade festival in her honor, or she would ask that the moon of Eridu be carved into a temple dedicated to worshipping her, or she may demand that the capital of city of Eridu be demolished and replaced with a statue of her. No one complied with any of her demands. So it was that the superconductor revolution stalled as suddenly as it began. The superconductor infrastructure that was already built on Eridu remains a marvel of the inhabited galaxy, but the materials were not available to expand them any further. People reverted to building fiber optic networks, copper wiring, and conventional semiconductor electronics. There remains the hope that the superconductor revolution might be revived, and efforts to that end continues on multiple fronts. Explorers scour the known star systems for the other deposits of elusive minerals, while scientists continue to make attempts at synthesizing the material in, laborator in laboratories. But there have been no breakthroughs so far. As for the mag magnate, her pronouncements eventually stopped, and the lights of the Golden Station were extinguished. It is known that the robots on the station were programmed to put the station into a dormant standby mode when it became uninhabited. Presumably, the mad magnate lies dead in her own palace, her mummified corpse preserved in the vacuum of space, though no one has tried to enter the station to confirm it. Nobody wants to find out if the station is also trapped with explosives. The asteroids remain booby-trapped to this day. The people of Eridu tell the story of the mad magnate and her golden station to any who will listen, though the message that one might glean from it is a mixed one. There is pride in Eridu's role in leading the superconductor revolution, and sorrow at the unfulfilled promise that was the outcome. There is anger at the mad magnate's utter selfishness, but also pity for her insanity and self-imposed exile. There is wonder in the technological and cultural marvel that is the Golden Station, still the most expensive and most advanced structure ever built by humanity, and there is the bitter disappointment that these resources were squandered on such a hubristic folly, left abandoned in the emptiness of space. But there's one thing that the people of Eridu all agree on, and it's this. Give a person too much money and power, and you'll be sorry when they do something crazy with it. So that's one of the chapters of the book. It's a story about money and greed and progress and... Uh, and bad management, I suppose, which is, um, depending on your view of politics today, might be quite timely, right? Bad management and wasting resources. Anyway, I guess it's always, it's always relevant, right? There's always someone wasting money somewhere. Um, so that's, so the book is filled with those. The book is filled with ideas. And, uh, I want to think that most of them are relevant to us. Oh, the Golden Station, I put puppy. So just as an example, I don't want to give away all the secrets. I don't want to give... So every every chapter in the book is inspired by something. And the Golden Station was expired, inspired by Nero's Golden House. So if you know your history, you would know that Nero was a Roman empire, emperor who was... He was not a very good emperor. And he, he built a golden house in Rome. Well, First of all, there was a great fire. Well, that was not the first. So while, while Nero was emperor, there was a great fire in Rome that burned down a lot of houses. And uh, people were not happy about how he responded to that. But in response to the fire, after the fire, he cleared out all the burnt houses. And he built a palace. <laughs> so in the place where people used to live, he demolished all the, all the stuff that was burned down and he built a palace. 
but it wasn't a normal palace. Like Nero's golden house, like people today, like the, the archaeologists who dig the place up, they can't figure out what it's for because it's it's opulent, and there's like baths and there's libraries and there's gardens and all sorts of stuff. But then it's not really a palace because it doesn't serve as a person's home. So so the way they read it. It's it it's not actually a palace in the sense that it's not expected for Nero himself to live there, but it's opulent. So what it might be, one possibility, one one hypothesis is that he tried to build a palace for the people. So Rome burned down, and instead of rebuilding houses and and rebuilding businesses so people can can get back to work and and have houses to live in. He built a palace for everyone, not really understanding that that's not what people need, right? Because presumably Nero himself lives in a palace, and he thinks that's, that's a great time. Like he's having he's having a great time living in home his own his own palace, and so he thought, well, I'll just build a palace for everybody. But then that that doesn't like in terms of economics, it doesn't work because. It doesn't make any money. Like nobody, it's not a business. It's not a farm. It doesn't grow food. People can't get water or food or, or work. Like, and it's not really a home. Like there's no bedrooms, so people can't actually live there. Like it's just, just a an opulent pleasure palace. It's not actually practical. So that's one one interpretation of what we find today in Nero's Golden House because it's it's not really a house and it's not really a palace, but it's opulent. So it's like. It's it's like a guy who has this grand idea of giving everybody a palace, but it doesn't actually work. So again, somewhat relevant today, right? Somewhat relevant to the、uh, impossible and unworkable policies that we see in some countries, United States, <coughs> Trump, and、uh, terrible policies that come out of those guys. Because they don't seem to understand how the economy works, they just do stuff. And they, anyway, so relevant stuff, <laughs> bad management. All right, so so every single chapter, every single chapter in this book has、uh, has ideas in it.、And、so if you like ideas, this is my book.、Uh, all right, well that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.